Acts chapter 14, we're making our way through Scripture. We finished up last week uh, with chapter 13. And just, just as you all are settling in, folks, do you know the, do you know the where, how sweet the worship time was? Okay, can I get an amen? Yeah. Getting into God's Word is just as sweet. That is to say, God speaks to us now through His Word, and that's really important. So we read here in chapter 14, now it happened in verse 1, it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. Verse 2, but the believing Jews stirred up the Gentiles, watch this, and poisoned their mind against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, city of Lyconia and surrounding regions, and they were preaching the gospel there. Verse 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leapt up, and he walked. Roger, would you do me a favor? Would you please stand and ask the Lord just to anoint our time together? Oh God, we in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you've already done here today, Lord. Thank you that you've touched our that you've answered prayers. Yes. Father, as we enter into the teaching, we ask that nothing gets spoken except your word, and people hear it, and it changes us all, Lord. Father, for the better, that you can use us to go out and glorify you and bring many into the kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. Everybody said together. Amen. All throughout Scripture, the New Testament, when you look at the four Gospels, you see Jesus walking the earth. He was on a seek and save mission for the people that no one else was really that interested in. If you notice that, first he went to Israel, obviously, where the promise, the, the Messiah was made. But then he went after people that society utterly rejected. And in Corinthians, I love the scripture in Corinthians when Paul writes, you know, amongst you guys, there's not many, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it a little bit, there's not many of you really smart. <laughs> There's not many of you of re great reputation. There's not many of you guys who are too handsome either. Uh, that's Wes's paraphrase, okay? And I can say that for the guys. By the way, you can laugh at any time. But my point is simply this, is that God calls anyone into his kingdom. It's, it's, the door is open for anyone who will just humble themselves and say, okay, Jesus, I need you. You died for my sin. But in, in, when Jesus came in the Gospels, almost everyone he came in contact with, if you watch this, was healed. Like physical healing. And he would forgive sin. And, but it, when you look at these physical healings, you're like, wow. And then we go into a, the book of Acts, and the miraculous things just keep happening. Like the scripture we just read. This guy was crippled from birth. He had never walked in his life. Imagine that. How dependent you are upon other people. And then Paul, the scripture says Paul looks at him. He sees something in him. The Lord shows him this. And then he says, get up and walk. The guy jumps up. It's miraculous. Now here at Calvary Chapel and in the kingdom of God, we have seen people healed. We've had a couple of people who had stage four cancer healed. We were in the hospital with this guy. who The family was being called in. And um, his, his liver, he was in liver failure. He had tumors all throughout his liver. 
and I was with Mark, who's now pastoring out at Calvary Chapel, Winfield, and we prayed for him. Six weeks later, he's sitting in the service. I'm like, whoa, amazing, Lord. You, you do the miraculous. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago. Michelle McGee's father, was uh, he, his blood poisoning, I mean, his, his, it, was, uh, it was septic, right? And so he's, he's dying. He's not conscious. They bring the family in to say goodbye. We get up on a Sunday morning. We, we talk to the Lord about it, right? The next, day, next morning, he opens his eyes. Now he's out of the hospital. So, so and then we have the Kleck, the Kleck twins. I think the Kleck, are the Klecks here? Were they here first service? Brian? The, I, I love telling this story. Now, um, Carrie had, had a mono babies, two boys. Is that what you call it? They're both off the same umbilical cord. Is that the thing? So the survival rate for twins off the same umbilical cord is 1 in 250,000. Is that correct? So this is years ago. And, and Carrie and, and, and uh, 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 Brian are sitting right over here. And I said, I said, all you ladies, go and surround Carrie because they did an ultrasound and the umbilical cord in their two boys was all twisted up. That's not good. And, and if you guys have ever had little boys, you know they twist up things, right? <laughs> well, guess what? They're our neighbors, and they have Bo and Ben, and these kids are little oxen. <laughs> I mean, they're five years old now? Four? They're four years old. They look like, okay, they're, they're these little, they're, they're, they're like, they, they just look like tackles for the L.A., they're, and they're healthy. The, you would look at them, and you would say, there's no way they were preemies. They were born preemies. So... God answers these prayers. We see it. So why sometimes doesn't he answer them? And, and that's the title of this morning's message. Why are some in Christ, as I was obviously believers, healed and others are not? Why is it that we can see these miraculous things happen, these beautiful healings happen, but sometimes it doesn't happen? Why is that? That's what we're going to spend our short time together this morning talking about. First of all, here in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are traveling. They're going to the synagogue, and they're sharing about the coming Messiah that was prophesied. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. He's there, and we see here in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews did what? They stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind. Interesting. You know what that word poison means in the Greek? What it literally means is they injured their minds. Think about this for a moment. Injured their minds. And what they ended up doing, the minds that were injured because they, they stirred up problems, is they tried to kill them. They injured their minds. So what happens is, Critical thinking goes out the window. Now it's all emotion. Now it's all based upon emotion. Now I grew up in a home where education was huge. I mean, my, my dad is 92 years old, three years old now, and he has his master's degree, which is like a B. So when we were growing up, education was it. So I got siblings who have their MDs and their masters and their PhDs. Uh, I didn't get that, but they, they, so emphasis was on the, the, the educational part of things. And so the, the idea of the miraculous is just kind of weird. It's like, no, that's, that's what weird people think, you know, and even Christians. I mean, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. But what we've done in the last 25 years is in our university system is we have injured this next generation. They can't think critically anymore. And that's why you're seeing the response to any critical thinking. You're seeing the response is violence. It's violence. It's, it's in your face. And, and now, if you've, if ladies, if you've had an abortion here, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking about you. There's forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and I firmly believe you will hold that baby in Christ one day. Can I get an amen? amen. So I'm not talking to you. If you're watching online, not talking to you or about you. But if you talk to people about this controversial idea of abortion, here's immediately what they say. Oh, it's a fetus. Okay, do you know that's a Latin word for little one? So when you point that out, they say, well, no, it's just, a, it's just a clump of cells. 
Then when you point out to them, do you know you're a clump of cells? And my clump of cells right around here is expanding all the time. So what happens is when you don't think critically, share this with you. When I, I grew up in Southern Cal, and um, when I was growing up, and I'll never forget this, in the early 70s, they, we had the condor, the California condor. It's a bird, right? And if you destroyed one of their eggs, a condor egg, if you went up there and you wanted to have an omelet, they, listen, six months in prison, $10,000 fine. Why? Because they say you're destroying a condor. Are we making sense, folks? But the child in the womb is a clump of cells. So without the critical thinking, without the critical thinking, people will, will react emotionally. There's no longer, a, you can have an, 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 a, a discussion uh, based upon logic, and that's what's happening here. They poison them, and the, the only way to respond to that is verse 3. Therefore, they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord. And the speaking boldly doesn't mean you're obnoxious. You just know your facts. It's like when people disagree with me on whether it's a child in the womb, I don't get, all, I don't get emotional. I know the science behind it. It is a child. It is a child. And, and I also know, again, that Jesus forgives. And I also know, again, that Jesus restores if you've gone through an abortion. So I don't, I don't condemn that at all. But I know the facts. So I, I don't have to yell. I don't have to raise my voice. If, I'm, if, if someone says, well, the Bible's a homophobic book, I don't have to raise my voice. I know it's not. God, God is not intimidated by someone who has same-sex attraction. He loves them. He came to die for them, and he wants to renew them. He wants to make them new creations. Can I have an amen? amen. So there's nothing to get upset about. So they spoke boldly because they had the truth on their side. And, and, and then we read here in verse 8, In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed with a, look at this, loud voice, interesting, stand up straight on your feet. And what does this dude do? He jumps up. I mean, you talk, you talk about a shocker. This guy, now he's dependent upon people to carry him around. I mean, if he has to use the restroom, he has to call, hey, hey, can you guys help me? This guy now jumps up. So the Lord's working kind of this mysterious way. This guy's there, but Paul looks at him, and the Lord kind of puts it on his heart, hey, call out loudly, stand so everyone can hear. This guy gets up and starts walking. Now, the guy had a choice. Watch this. He had a choice. He could have looked at Paul and said, you're nuts. What's wrong with you? Don't you see? I've been crippled all my life. What's your problem, dude? What are you, like a televangelist? What's your deal? No, he responded. So there was a step of faith that he took in this healing process. Interestingly enough, now, when it comes to healing specifically, and again, the title of this morning's message is why some in Christ, why some believers are healed and why others aren't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let the cat out of the bag. As most of you know, I don't like cats, so we're going to let this one out of the bag. <laughs> the, the premise of the question is wrong, actually, and I'll explain that later. But we are called to believe, commanded to believe. When you study science, when you study cosmology, when you study astrophysics and all these things, you know there's a mind that put this universe together. There's no other explanation. In fact, Albert Einstein said, I would like to know the mind behind the universe. And then Isaac Newton said, if you really think you must believe in God, if you think with your half of your mind, you won't think, you won't believe in God. And then one of the, one of the, prophets of the new atheist movement, a guy named Richard Dawkins. Um, oh, one more quote. So um, uh, 
the Bible also says a fool in his heart says there is no God. Fool in his heart says And then Richard Dawkins, who's the, who's the, the kind of leading atheist, who says that, well, the complexity of the DNA is so complex that someone had to have created it, and then the guy who's interviewing goes, oh, what? An atheist saying the DNA was created? And then they, they called him on it. They said, well, why are you saying that? You, so you think there's, you believe in creation? He goes, no, I don't believe in creation. I just believe aliens from another planet came and put it on our earth. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, all right. Critical thinking. But, so we're commanded to believe. Now watch this. Who, so the question I want to ask you guys is who did create the universe? Who did create the world? The world was created. There's evidence for that. There's evidence all over. There's not, who created you? Your DNA is so complex we haven't even figured it out yet. Your DNA is so complex, it's a written code, we haven't figured it out. So, a general question, and then who delivered Israel from Egypt through the Red Sea? That's not a story, it's not a metaphor, it actually happened, and there's archaeological evidence for it. And so then, who brought the Son of God into the world through a virgin? That happened. So these are questions we need to answer. Who did that? And then, who raised Lazarus from the dead? A fact of history. Jesus raised him from the dead. So the question is, who did all that? So now, personally speaking, do I believe now, if God says something, is it true? Or do I rely on my own reasoning, which can be fickle? If I rely on my own emotions, which can change by the hour? Or do I believe steadily on what God has said? And then Jesus, in in John 14, you guys know this scripture, he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Believe, trust, and this isn't, an, this isn't an intellectual assent of, yeah, I believe. The scripture says the demons believe in the Son of God and tremble. We've talked about this many times before, but I think it's worth repeating. The word faith means to rely upon. Demons, and I've seen, we've seen demonic manifestations. A lot of that stuff in the movies is actually inspired, and don't go watch these movies, <laughs> is actually inspired by demonic manifestation. We've seen them. We've seen it. But the reality, and I've lost my point. Where, where was I? Where's my wife? Honey, help. <laughs> huh? D- yeah, demonic. Can you go back a little further? <laughs> believe in God, believe also in me. Belief, belief, belief. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful service we've had. <laughs> I can't remember what I said. So, so we believe, okay? We'll just, we'll just end it there. Um, we believe. Uh, we believe in what God has said through what has been created, what through, through, uh, through the DNA, through the complexity of all these things. But now when we come to Scripture and healing, now we believe that God heals, Amen. We believe that God heals the physical body. We've talked about this before. We've seen it here. But we've also prayed with the same faith and people aren't, haven't been healed. Believers. In fact, we, we, we quote unquote lost, although we know where Dan Dickerber is, we lost a, a brother in, from Calvary Chapel this last week through pancre- pancreatic cancer. We know where he is, but we prayed for healing. Didn't happen. So what we need to do is we need to look back. Okay, Lord, so this is a mystery. So, Lord, when it comes to healing, how are we to see it? And what we do is we use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Now, now watch this, because Paul has something to say about this. In Timothy 5, uh, chapter, chapter 5, verse 23, he says, he's talking to Timothy, he says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake um, and your infirmities. So, Timothy, who was a young pastor, 40-year-old guy, was drinking the water, and he said, listen, take a little wine. It's a medicinal thing to help settle your stomach. And I I got this theory. It must have been the same water we have here in Troy, Missouri, because when I drank the water in the city here, I'd be like, my stomach hurts. Sorry, water people. Anyways, but so so my, my point is just simply this. He said, it's medicinal. So, okay, so what Paul didn't do is say, hey, believe you're gonna be healed. He didn't. At least it's not recorded. And then we go on here in another scripture in Timothy, uh, chapter 4, uh, 2 Timothy 4.20, when he says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus, 
I have left in my lead is sick. So this guy named Trophus was sick. And in other scripture, we knew he had a fever. And yet Paul, Paul left him sick? Come on, Paul. You're the same guy that called this guy this cripple. You're the same one in, in Acts that wherever you went, people were being radically healed. Why didn't you, why didn't you heal this guy before you left? So we take scripture, we interpret scripture. So are we now no longer to believe in, in, in healing? No. We are to believe. Then he goes on and he talks about himself. Here in Corinthians, he says this. He says, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth. But if I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above that which he sees to be or hears from me. So Here's the point Paul's making. He's had all this incredible insight, this revelation, the Bible says, of who Jesus is. And he had been, he'd been um, uh, attend- they t- tried to kill him three times. In fact, one time they stoned him. They thought he was dead. They drug him out of the city. And he says, you know what? I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but he was talking about himself. He said, and he went to the third heaven and he heard things that I can't even express to you. We don't know if his music, we don't know if his his voice. I heard something so wonderfully beautiful. I can't, and I, I saw things that it wouldn't be lawful for me to try and even explain to you. He saw heaven. He saw our true home with a capital H. He, he saw what we, man was truly created for before the fall. And there was a fall. And there was a Garden of Eden. And we all did come from one woman. The DNA evidence shows that. So he, he's saying all this stuff. And he, he goes, but now watch. He says, and lest I should be exalted above measure by abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me? Lest I be exalted above measure. So wait, 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 wait a second, Paul. So God allowed this to happen. Thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it is. And a messenger, we know a messenger that literally translated in the Greek, so an angel from Satan. To buff. So could it be that God has a purpose sometimes in suffering? And then we, we, he concludes with this. He says, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities, that word infirmities can mean disease, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, and for Christ's sake. What? Paul, why aren't you just praying healing over yourself? So, through the years, Calvary's existed here now uh, about 33 and a half years. We have seen the miraculous. We've also seen people that, not part of Calvary, but, but part of a movement that says that if, you, if you're sick, Number one, it's not God's will, which that's actually not in Scripture, but, but you, you, can, you can kind of bounce back and forth on that point. Or number two, you don't have enough faith to be healed. Now, can you imagine being sick and someone telling you the reason why you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith? I've known people who've died of illnesses, and they had lots of faith. They had more faith than I did. So what's going on? God is sovereign. His ways aren't my ways. When our second born son died in our arms, I remember having chatting with my wife and we were like, okay, well, the Lord could have healed him, but he didn't. And I went into this this time and we were trusting the Lord. I mean, the Lord made himself known through all of it. And we prayed for healing. Uh, Jacob had a trisomy 13 defect in his DNA, one of the little digits in his, his DNA with trillions of digits in the DNA, coded DNA was off, and that's what killed him. 
And so for three months, I didn't talk about it. Because when, usually when men, when we're in pain, we don't like to talk about it because it, it starts bubbling up and it's easier just to stuff it. That's what I was doing. And I was, I was playing golf one afternoon and I was by myself and it's in California and, and I was, no one in front of me, no one behind me and I, I, can, I can close my eyes, I can see everything. And I sat there, I had an eight iron, I was doing this with the eight iron and I just, I dared ask the question, Why? And a still clarion voice, still small voice, not audible, because we're made of spirit as well, gentle clarion shepherd's voice said, do you trust me? I'm sitting there going like this. And I stopped and I looked up. I said, yes, I trust you. Why? Why? gentle shepherd's voice. I know my shepherd's voice. He said, do you trust me? (laughs) Yes, I trust you, Lord. Why? All I can do is explain to you what happened. In a nanosecond, it's like an eternity, you know, we're, we're in this thing called time, it's a, it's a physical thing, and eternity doesn't have time. But in a nanosecond, the Lord downloaded this information, and here's what he said. Son, you will see things in this life you will not understand. You will see, I'm going to take you places, and by that time, we were behind the Iron Curtain a lot with the persecuted church, and I can concur, that's exactly how they feel about worship. I'm gonna, you're going to see things you will not understand. Will you trust me? I didn't get an answer, but I got the perfect answer. Will you trust me? And I said, yes, Lord. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. The exact same thing happened with Job. Job, some theologians say that Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. And the oldest book in the Bible deals with the what? The problem of pain. Because you guys know the story. Job's the most righteous man on earth. And and Lucifer goes before God and says, Hey, this Job guy, yeah, he's, he's good. He serves me. He loves me. Yeah, but you know what? He only loves you because of the blessings you give him. Take those away. He'll curse you to your face. And what Lucifer was telling him as a fallen angel, Lucifer was an archangel, took one third of the demons with him. And so Lucifer was mocking God saying, men don't really love you for no reason. They only love you because you give them something. And so you guys know everything was taken from him except his wife who said, curse God and die. It's like, come on. And then what happens is three friends come along and they're they're all sitting around and he's gone through this great loss and so all these religious friends are coming to Job saying, hey Job, it's a real bummer what happened but you must have done something wrong. God's just. You must have done something wrong. And Job's sitting there going, I don't think so, guys. How would you like to have friends like that? I, I don't think, guys, I don't think so. I don't, I've searched my heart. I've searched, I, you know, I didn't even look upon the maiden. I made a, a covenant with my eyes, not even to look upon the young maidens. I, I don't, don't, but they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You've done something wrong. But he didn't curse God. Didn't blame God. So Lucifer goes back before God, and he says, see my servant, he hasn't cursed me to my face, you lose. Lucifer goes, no, skin for skin. You put a, let me put a disease on him, and he'll curse you to his face, to your face, rather. So then Job breaks out and boils. <laughs> really? Really? And then he was just taking broken pot, pot shirts and he's scraping his, so he's now he's sitting, he's got these boils all over him. He's lost his family except for the wife. Couldn't you have taken her? Anyways, you know, he's, except for his wife and he's sitting there and now his friends go, ah, look, you have this disease. See, see, you are guilty of something. Then Job broke. God, he said, I've searched my mind I've done nothing wrong. 
Tell me why. I call you into account why. And God tells him, Job, how much do you really know? You're calling me to account? You don't put me on the witness stand, Job. You don't interrogate me. And then Job realized, and he put his face in the dust and wept. He said, God, you are God. No answer came. That's what real faith is. Now, we are to believe God. When we pray for people who are sick, you are to believe God. And listen, some of you might need to hear this. When you believe, sometimes God takes you out out of your comfort zone. You know, Peter in the boat going across the Sea of Galilee. Don't you got who loves Peter? Who loves Peter? So he's in the boat. They see Jesus walking on water. By the way, God can uh, can suspend the laws of nature. He's God. Jesus is walking on the water. They all scream, ah, a ghost. Then Jesus is like, guys, relax. It's me. Then Peter goes, Jesus, you're walking on water. That looks really cool. Before surfing was invented. And he says, call me out on the water. So Paul, Peter gets out on the water. Some of us need to step out of our comfort zones with this stuff. We are coming into a time when God really begins to move in people's hearts. And that's what Hope Lincoln County is all about. You know, we have an, a prolific drug and, and addiction and twisted problem with people in, our, in, in homes in Lincoln County. Listen, these are the people Jesus came for. And so he wants to use his body that if, if, if you're somewhere, you're in Kroger's and the Lord puts it on your heart and you see someone in need, go pray for them. Well, get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. Well, didn't Peter sink? Yeah, get out of the boat. <laughs> Jesus pulled him up. What about the woman? I love this, this woman who had been to every doctor, had this issue of blood. I couldn't even imagine it in her day, 2,000 years ago. There's this huge crowd around Jesus. She pushed, she's unclean. She's ceremonially unclean. She's not supposed to be in public. She goes, tough. I'm getting to Jesus. So she she wakes her way through, and she must have fallen on her face because she grabs the hem of of his garment. There's hundreds of people around. Jesus says, power's gone out of me. Who did that? And his disciples are like, Jesus, there's hundreds of people around you. They're all touching you. And then Jesus tells this woman, your faith made you well. She got to Jesus. Then the centurion of a Gentile, not even a Jew, goes to Jesus. He says, my servant, he's, he's my favorite servant. He's a good man. Please, can you heal him? And Jesus gets up to go to the centurion's home. The centurion, this is, a, this is like a captain in, in the special forces of the Romans. He says, no, no. He said, I'm not worthy, worthy for you to come into my house I'm a man of authority. If I tell my, this guy, my sergeant, to go do this, I know he'll go do it. And Jesus, I know if you say the word, my servant will be healed. He believed. Not only that Jesus could do it, but that Jesus would do it. And that hour, the centurion makes his way back to his house, and that hour that he asked Jesus to heal his servant, he was healed, and he asked this, the messenger, he said, what hour is he healed? Four o'clock. That's when I asked him. He was healed the very same hour. This is belief. This is trust in Jesus Christ. So I go back to the original question. Why are some in Christ healed and others are not? It's a fallacy. The premise is wrong. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are going to be healed, ultimately healed, 100%. Now, there might be illnesses you have here, a disease you have here, the Lord will heal you of, right on. 
Pray for one another. The Lord has something, a testimony for you to tell. He has, he has more for you to do. But sometimes he doesn't. So I'm going to share a song with you here in a moment. It's called Nick's Song. Or it's actually called A Conversation with Nick. It was written, some of you remember Nick Nicoletti and Jane Nicoletti. And about 18, 19 years ago, they came and, and they were attending Calvary and just wonderful believers. And Nick was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And so immediately, we prayed over him, we prayed over him, and his wife, Jane, put him on this diet that I was just like, no sugar, no, no, car, car, no carbs. No, and so he would drink this concoction that would choke a horse. And it was just all natural food. It, it was, you know, no McDonald's, you know, none of that food. But, but he was, they were in it. They were in the battle. And he actually outlived all the predictions that the physicians had. But, but his, his wife would call and she would say, you know, Pastor, can you bring the elders? And we'd go down. They were living in Lake St. Louis and we'd pray for him. And, you know, he's, he's in for the fight. He's going. And we did that several times with the elders. And then one day I got a call from his wife, Jane. She said, Pastor, would you mind coming alone? And as I came in, um, Nick was sitting on the couch. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> and I could tell he was tired. He had been fighting a long time. And it was one of those times when you start talking, you're listening to yourself, because you don't know what the next word's going to be. It's like when the Lord kind of takes over. And I said, Nick, and he said, and I could tell he felt guilty. He said, I'm tired, I'm just tired. I said, Nick, we serve a wonderful shepherd. You lay down. You're his sheep. When it's time for you to go, he'll step into this room and he'll call you by name and he'll take you home. He kept telling me, Pastor, he at large, and last name Nicoletti, is that giving you an idea of what they're Roman Catholic, Sicilian, right? He said, you have to promise me you'll give an invitation, an actual invitation at my memorial service. And I usually don't do that. I've done it before, but I, I thought, okay. So his family shows up. I mean, Italian. Italian, Italian. And one of, his, one of his brothers actually comes up to me. This is no joke. They came in in a limousine, and he comes up, he pats me on the cheek. He goes, you're a beautiful man. Uh, <laughs> His whole family, so we, we, had the big plat, we had the big platform here, and then we had, we had about 500 chairs set up, and the whole, the, his family took the whole front row, probably about 60 people. When I gave the invitation, I just simply explained the gospel. His whole family. And I said, if you'd like to put your trust, rely upon Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, I want you to raise your hand right now. No one looked around, every hand went straight up. And I went, oh, Nick, I'm so glad I did that. Because when I got to heaven and I hadn't done that, you would have been upset. 